all the panelists and moderators, also to all the participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat malam untuk semua dokter-dokter yang saya hormati. Welcome to the fourth Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society webinar in conjunction with JEC Ophthalmic Trauma Service with the title of, of Overcoming the Challenges in Ophthalmic Trauma. We would also like to welcome and send our biggest gratitude to our honorable panelists and moderators from all over the world. From India to Nepal, to Pakistan, to Malaysia, to Singapore, Taiwan, Australia, and United States of America. Thank you for all of your support and enthusiasm. Special acknowledgement to our sponsor tonight, uh, to Chendo Pharmaceutical, for making this possible. Before we jump into the main program, I would like to invite Dr. Yunia Irawati as the head of Ophthalmic Trauma Service in JCI Hospitals and Clinics to give her welcoming notes. To Dr. Ira, please, uh, the time. Thank you, Dr. Alia. Welcome, everyone. First, I would like to say thank you for the all participants who have joined with us in the fourth APOTS, APOTS webinar in conjunction with Jakarta Eye Central Ophthalmic Trauma Service. More than 1,700 uh, 1, uh, participants from all over the region had registered to with, join with our webinar and incredibly uh, grateful for the enthusiasm. Thank you for the Jakarta Eye Center team to making this webinar possible. Special thank you for the president of AIPOTS, Professor Natarajan, and AIPOTS Scientific Committee, Dr. Ganga Dara Sundar, and Professor Caroline Chi as a one of board AIPOTS for the collaboration. I would also like to send my best appreciation to our international panelists and moderator from nine countries, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Australia, USA, and of course our colleague in uh, the Jakarta Eye Center. The webinar today will mainly focus in the case-based discussion for challenging trauma cases. Hence, the topic of overcoming the challenges in ophthalmic trauma. Its panelists will share the unique cases and their experts in managing various trauma cases. Hopefully, this case-based approach will be a good way to share the current update in ophthalmic trauma management, while also keeping a good connection between the trauma society all over the world. And on behalf of everyone ever involved in the web this webinar, I hope you can enjoy this meeting. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Please, Dr. Alia, you can. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yunia, for the warm welcoming notes. So uh, we would also like to invite Professor Natarajan as the president of the Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society to give a word or two before the start of the session. Professor Natarajan is the future retinal surgeon from the Aditya Jot Hospital, Mumbai, India. Uh, please, uh, Professor Natarajan, the time is yours. Good evening all. Welcome to the fourth uh, Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society webinar where we are uh, having a session by the Jakarta Eye Center. I am glad in February this year I inaugurated the Jakarta Eye Center uh, trauma session. I am happy Dr. Yumiya, Dr. Gita, Dr. Johan, Dr. Nano and Dr. Yangar Sundar and Rupesh Agarwal are put up an excellent program and wish everybody a great learning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Natarajan. Before we move on to the first session, uh, I would like to show you the rundown of this webinar. Basically, this webinar will be divided into six distinctive sessions, each will specifically discuss about different aspects of atomic trauma and will be moderated by the experts on each field. So here's the rundown, and without further delay, I'd like to invite Dr. Ganga Dara Sundar as the moderator for the first session, Eyelid and Orbital Trauma. Dr. Ganga is an orbit and oculofacial surgery 
uh, surgeon, sorry, in from the National University Hospital Singapore, Dr. Ganga. Please, the session is yours. Thank you, Dr. Alia, Dr. Yunia, and Dr. Gita. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce three wonderful oculoplastic surgeons from this part of the world. Uh, Dr. Hana Vita, the head of oculoplastics, followed by Dr. Rohit Saiju from Nepal, and Dr. Yunia, who's going to share a pole-to-pole -pole case. And finally, to top it off, we have an expert speaker from Denver, Colorado, Professor Prem Subramaniam, who will teach us one of the, how to manage one of the challenging aspects of orbital trauma. Over to you, Dr. Hanya Vita, to share us something about eyelid lacerations. Thank you, Dr. Ganga. Uh, uh, good evening to all panelists and all moderator and uh, participants uh, who join this meeting. Uh, thank you for your uh, join with my uh, webinar to, tonight. Okay, I would like to share my experience how to manage eyelid affusion with canalcular laceration. Uh, my case report, a uh, boy four years old came to JEC hospital with chief complaint bleeding from the right eye after hook to a nail on the wall two hours before admission. Two hours before admission, the patient was playing around, jumped, and his eyelid accidentally hooked to a nail on the wall. He was brought to Jakarta Eye Center Hospital directly. And the optical status, uh, there was a full thickness inferior eyelid rupture with canalicular laceration, and the other part is normal. And the left eye within uh, the normal limit. And diagnosis of this patient, eyelid affusion with canaliculial laceration of the right eye. I, I plan to do a uh, repair the eyelid affusion and canaliculial laceration with monocular silicone intubation of the right eye in general anesthesia. This is my video. The first, uh, I irrigated with saline uh, from the clotting and the debris in the wound. And then uh, I try to find uh, laceration of the canalicular with a Bowman probe. Uh, after, at, after I identified the uh, canalicular laceration, and then I insert the silicon tube with stand through the pantom. After that, I remove the stand and then uh, for uh, intubation to the medial cut of laceration, I postpone because I plan to do the suture of the canal, the conjunctiva first. Yeah. I, I should do the conjunctiva with interrupted suture with buried knot because to prevent uh, the irritation to the eyeball. After finish the conjunctiva suturing, I insert the silicon tube so the a medial cut of the uh, canalicular laceration into the lacrimal sac until we cannot insert. Sorry. Uh, in, sorry, uh, I. I my problem with my video, and then I insert the uh, silicon tube to the lacrimal sac. How much I have to insert the silicon until we cannot insert uh, the silicon anymore. After that, I, I suture the periocular tissue around the canalicular laceration. 
uh, I use the uh, Fikril 7O to, to shoot to the periocar uh, canal decorator tissue. I suture until all of the tissue cover uh, of the silicone tube. After that, uh, I suture the orbicularis, orbicularis muscle around the canalicular rupture of uh, canalicular rupture. We use the, the same uh, Ficryl 702. Another 30 seconds, uh, Dr. Hanavita. Yeah, okay. And then uh, after that, I stitch the orbicular muscle. I start from the, la the lateral to the medial. We use the uh, Ficryl 602. Sorry, that's uh, the five minute warning here. Yeah. Okay. And then the last I stitch the skin. Would you like to conclude with your uh, learning points? Yeah. Okay. Finally, I I suture the margin of the eyelid, and then uh, I fixated the silicone tube to the skin and to orbicularis, like this. This is the result. Post operation, I, I give the patient with antibiotics three times orally, orally and anti-inflammation three times. A day orally and antibiotic eye ointment for uh, the wound. And then uh, suture removal two weeks after surgery and silicone removal three months after surgery. This is the result of the patient three months after surgery. And then uh, this is one year after surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanavita, for sharing uh, a common problem, but how a combination of good surgical technique and a good experienced surgeon delivers great results. Uh, while Dr. Rohit uploads his presentation and shares the screen, uh, Dr. Hanavita also shared the point that most childhood accidents are from domestic accidents. So it just happens in your neighborhood and inside your house with toys, nails, doorknobs, so on and so forth, and how education prevention is more important than cure. Uh, great video, Dr. Hanavita. Is Dr. Rohit Saiju re ready to upload his slides? And she also highlighted the value of how the technique interoperatively identifies a cut end of the canaliculus for either monocanalicular or bicanalicular intubation. If you can't find the canaliculus, Dr. Hanavita, how would you do it? Rohit, please upload your slide. I think Dr. Rohit not uh, in here yet, Dr. Ganga. But would you like to proceed, Yunia, for your, with your case then? Yes, I think... Uh... I'll do the presentation the next, uh, Dr. Ganga. Yes, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, thank you. We can okay. answer these questions uh, towards end. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ganga. Uh, now I would like to present about the multiple approach in managing a complex blunt trauma. Right, please. Right, please. Yeah, I have a patient, five, five, uh, 45 years old man with suffering a blunt trauma of his eye and uh, when the wound block is suddenly hit into the face while he was working and the eyelid laceration of the left upper eyelid and lower eyelid is present accompanied by decreased visual, visual acuity he was treated with the initial eyelid repair and then uh, the patient usually uh, come to us three days after the surgery uh, sorry the, the, after the accident when we when we do the examination, we can see uh, the visual acuity is light perception, the normal intraocular pressure, 
There is a multiple proline suture at the superior and inferior eyelid, also the medial cantal region. And uh, we saw there is a subconjunctiva hemorrhage, and then there is a hyphema at the anterior chamber. The lens was cataract, and uh, the, vitreo, uh, the fundus could uh, do the examen very well. And slide. Yeah, this is the USG examination. We can see there is a retinal detachment. And this is the orbital CT scan. We can see in here, there is a multiple fracture, uh, usually in the nasal, um, at the nasal orbital, nasal ethmoidal fracture, grade one. Yeah, uh, and we can see there is uh, in here uh, from the CT scan also. Uh, slide. And we assess the patient with full thickness upper and lower raptor with the canal collapse involvement and at the medial canal raptor uh, left eye. There is a nasal orbital ethmoidal fracture, nasal fracture, and, and the septum deviation. There is a hyphema, traumatic cataract, vitreous hemorrhage, and retinal detachment. We hospitalize this patient and do the complete blood workup, uh, radiology screening the, for the COVID. And we plan to do the repair eyelid restoration with silicone, into, silicone tube uh, and then the construction for the medial wall and the uh, uh, cantal reconstruction. And the, our colleagues from the ENT uh, do the septorinoplasty. And uh, our colleagues for the uh, trauma surgeon uh, did the TLS uh, fee and FECO emulsification and silicon oil. Slide. After the hyphema is resolved, I think Dr. Sandy will be uh, continue the surgery in this uh, patient. Please, Dr. Sandy. This is uh, our surgery did by Dr. Sandy. Dr. Sandy. Sandy, you're still unmuted. Oh. Yep. Uh, okay, yeah. So I did the surgery. Um, I do the combinations of cataract extractions and vitrectomy to resolve the, vitre uh, the vitreous and then the retinal detachment. So this is the first step. There is a synechia in the anterior part, so I tried to do the fisco dissection. Uh, to release all the, the, uh, the iris from the lens. After I release all the synechia, I do the, the FECO emulsification as usual, do, the, uh, do every steps in a normal way. We can see here uh, from the, I mean, behind the lens, we can see there's the fundus reflex is a bit low and there is some vitreous homage over there. So I try to uh, extract the cataract with the usual FECO emulsifications and then I put the, the lens. So this is the part that I do the IA of the, of the lens. And then yeah, you can see here in the posterior segment, there is a little bit seen of the vitreous uh, hemorrhage. So I put the lens in the back. And then because I will continue it to do the vitrectomy, I try to put one stitch to make the anterior chamber uh, stable. 30 more seconds, Dr. Sandy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, I did the vitrectomy. We can see here there's a little bit mild, mild of vitreous hemorrhage and maybe after, so I did try to clean all the hemorrhage from the, cor, uh, from the vitreous cavity. Uh, okay, after I try to finish all the blood from the vitreous cavity, maybe we can see here there is a shallow detachment actually in the superotemporal part. Is it from eight o'clock until 12 o'clock? Maybe. This is the part that I still try to finish all the vitreous. I put the triamcinol on just to make sure that all the vitreous is already being gone. And we can see here that in the supratemporal, there is a little bit break or tear over there. And then I try to 
cleaned up all the vitreous that is remains still in the posterior part. Okay, and then I try to make sign with the endodiotermy for the brake part, and then I do the uh, fluid air exchange to take it out all the uh, the fluid from behind the behind the brake, and then maybe we can make move forward a little bit. Fast forward. Yep, and then I do the three hundred sixty degrees of laser in all all the retina and then maybe this is the last part. I see that after that we can see there's a little bit intraocular corridor detachment and then I put the silicone oil. Uh, the reason is because uh, there will be another procedure for these patients just to make the eye stable. Okay, next slide. Okay, I think, uh, I think uh, after Dr. Sandy did the operation, I did for the uh, eyelid laceration and uh, the ENT doctor did the uh, nasal uh, for the septorinoplasty. First, I did identify the rupture. Uh, I look the suture is not proper and then I uh, lose the suture. I deal with the probing uh, to know if there is a laceration at the superior canalicular. But in the inferior eyelid, when I insert the probing, and then I, I can see the posterior, uh, I mean the proximal of our, my probe. And then after that, I make sure it with the uh, elevate the periosteum surrounding the uh, canalicula and the lacrimal sac to make sure it, uh, there is a laceration in the inferior canalicular, but uh, now I know there is no laceration at the inferior, only the avulsion or the uh, medial cantal at the inferior, because I, I didn't show the uh, proximal of the canalicular. And then I try to find the canaliculus proximally. Yeah, in here. Using the microscope is uh, very easy to find. And then I did the irrigation to make sure it, uh, the, the lacrimal sun. And after that, I suture the periosteum at the medial cantal to reposition first and put the insertion of the tube from the inferior and then from the superior canalicular go to the communicans uh, carnacular and uh, the after the silicon probe is uh, on the nasal yeah and then uh, for the canalicular laceration i should during the medial cantal foot I using the proline CO and then put the silicone and I suture the eyelid margin for their opposition the uh, full thickness eyelid margin <coughs> at the at the superior and then I suture all the wound, yeah, subcutaneous to approximately, and then uh, the skin with the proline, 6 o. After, after the surgery, the ENT doctor did the uh, surgery for a <coughs> the septorinoplasty. Okay, uh, sorry, the time. Yeah, I think uh, after after this, yeah, uh, Dr. Sandy will be explain about uh, the end of the result. Dr. Sandy, please. Yeah, in about 30 seconds, please. Yeah, okay. 
Next slide, please. With the questions for the experts and Dr. Rohit is standing by to present next. Yes. And finally, we'll have okay. the expert lecture by Professor Prem Subramanian. Yeah. So, okay, I will uh, faster. This is one week post surgery. The retina was good. Uh, and then, but uh, the physical equity is still three, uh, 0 0.05. So I consulted neuro-ophthalmology deficiency to find if there are any problems from the deficiency slide that Alia will present after okay. this one. Okay, so let me share my slide because uh, apparently they don't have my current slide yet. So, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so basically the patient came to my uh, clinic with uh, persistent decreased vision after the surgery. Uh, the consensual reflex of the filler eye is de was decreased with good posterior segment. Uh, unfortunately, other examinations such as facial field examination or other facial function testing could not be performed <laughs> due to some barrier. So we still try to figure out whether this is a traumatic optic neuropathy cases or it's actually, uh, it was actually global retinal dysfunction due to traumatic retinal detachment. So we plan to perform further examination, but unable to do so because the patient never came back. So I think we will leave the question to the Dr. Prem's expertise afterwards. So yeah, that's the end of the case for this one. Uh, th thank you for sharing the case. I think Dr. Rohit is standing by. But I assume your question for Professor Prem later on, who will address talk, talk on traumatic optic neuropathy, while Dr. Rohit is uploading and sharing his screen, is, is a very nice and very challenging case of a lid, lacrimal, orbital injury, globe injury, it's a close globe injury, which had anterior segment and posterior segment features, and finally with poor outcome with the challenge of a traumatic optic neuropathy. That's actually completes the definition of ophthalmic trauma intraocular, extraocular, adnexal, and facial. So Rohit, are you ready to share the slide? Uh, yes, I'm, hi everyone. Uh, okay. Apologize not being in the schedule because of the interruption of electricity in my home. Uh, here I am. I'm audible, Ganga? Yes, yes you are. Go ahead please, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, even everyone. Especially, I would like to be thankful to Dr. Yunya and Dr. Ganga, providing me a platform to share my knowledge in some of the challenging cases. So, I will be going to present a Calvarian bow graph for the all orbital floor fracture cases. Uh, myself is Rohit Saizu from Kathmandu. I do not have any financial disclosure to say. Here is a referral cases, case of 27 years old male who sustained a road traffic accident four months ago and presented to me with a, about seven millimeter of enophthalmus, diplopia at vertical gauge. And this patient came very lately to me because of the several incidents. He became the contact tracing person and stayed for quarantine for some time, then had meningitis and stayed in the hospital for another few weeks and came only after four months of the incident. So in examination, he had vision of six by six in both eyes. In the right eye, there was a limitation of extra movement in all gazes in anterior segment and fundus found normal in the right eye as well in left eye. In examination in heart tail by bar of one and five millimeter, about seven millimeter of enophthalmus in the right, being the 17 millimeter in the right eye and four millimeter in left eye. So here the panoramic view of the CT scan, you see the craniofacial fracture as a big depressed fracture of the frontal bone as well as you see there is a uh, impure type of the broad fracture with the orbital rim and there's a big defect in the roof of the orbit and the inferior orbital rim as well as middle wall has gone. In another CT you can see there is a defect in the roof and inferior uh, floor of the orbit has depressed down quite. So we plan for surgery uh, combined with the neurosurgeons and MaxFax uh, surgeon stream. And neurosurgeon provided us a very nice piece of calvarial bone. And the patient had uh, enophthalmus of the remarkable seven millimeter. That's why we uh, decided to use uh, 
autogenous calvarial bone as an implant for the blood fracture repair. So here the small video is showing that the approach to the blood fracture here, inferior fornix has exposed and after gently cauterized the inferior fornicial tissue, gave the incision in the conjunctiva and underlying tissue along with the periosteum and lifted the periosteum very nicely and approached to the fractured area. And we identified the extent of fracture posteriorly and sidewise as well. And then we fix up that calvarial bone piece nicely, making the uh, convexity part superiorly so it will uh, augment the little bit volume in the orbit. So during the surgery, we found that there is a nice pulsatile proptosis. That is because of the superior uh, roof of the orbit was defect and uh, this encephalocele is giving the pulsatile things. Uh, my neurosurgeons did a very nice job. The huge calvarial defect of the frontal bone was repaired by, by the uh, bone cement and, and plating was done very nicely. So uh, this part has very nicely done. And this is the portion of the calvarial bone which harvested from here and we placed very nicely and it is clipped in the infraorbital rim and which support the floor of the orbit at the same time it will augment the volume of the orbit. And after the surgery, uh, there was about four millimeter of inothalmus as corrected. Still there is a small amount because you know the, this is very old case, four or five million months old. In comparing the hypoglobus in the left preoperative eye, you see, has corrected very nicely and about four millimeter of endothermos corrected. This is pretty satisfactory outcome looking at the, his previous preoperative features. And he has got little amount of limitation in the uh, vertical gaze in extra movement, but in the uh, horizontal gaze, uh, there is no diplopia, only the diplopia in the extreme of gaze, which is professionally quite, quite satisfactory. So what are the advantages of the uh, calvarial bone graft? Calvarial bone graft is autogenous uh, donor tissue. That's why it is very biocompatible and very much uh, less chance of getting the extrusion and infection and revascularization yeah. can occur very nicely. Yeah, sorry, and this advantage is this. Yeah. Can I have one minute more? Just a quick finish summarize. And the disadvantage is that the harvesting part is very difficult. We have to do the second operation to harvest the things. And we ocular plastic surgeons are not very much expert in the things. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Amit, Alok, and Pranay, who was with me during this combined team for this boy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rohit. That was a great case, and you're showing that as an ocular plastic surgeon, you're not just dealing with the lid lacrimal orbit, but you're dealing with the face calvarial skeleton. And we practice reduce, reuse, and recycle. So we take body parts and reconstruct the face. Uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce Professor Prem Subramaniam. Uh, he's a, a renowned professor of orbital surgery, neuroophthalmology, an educator, an inspiration for all of us around the world, and an APORTS member, proud to say that. He's going to share with us his perspectives on traumatic optic neuropathy. What's new? Over to you, Professor Subramanya. All right. Thank you very much. It's my real honor to speak to everyone today and to talk about what we have, where we are with traumatic optic neuropathy at this time, and what comes next. I have no relevant financial disclosures. A typical case, like you've already seen for someone who might have traumatic optic neuropathy, it'd be a 24-year-old driver driving at high speed on the highway runs off the road. This driver was not restrained in any way, struck the forehead, and lost consciousness for 15 minutes. They were stable, awake and alert two hours later, and at that point, noted to have no light perception in the right eye, 6-6 six, six vision in the left eye, an amniotic pupil in the right eye, so a large RAPD, and everything else was unremarkable. In particular, you can see the fundus looks normal. There's no optic disc hemorrhage. And of course, at this point in time, there's no pallor either. So <clears throat> this patient, of course, is interested in treatment. You as a physician want to treat. You suspect traumatic optic neuropathy. Are we going to give medicine? Are we going to do surgery? 
or are we simply going to observe? What helps us make those decisions? And where do these treatments even come from? Why do we use steroids? We use steroids because the classic model for optic nerve injury is neurologic injury and specifically spinal cord injury. And in animal models where you have axonal crush or transection, the use of corticosteroids was shown potentially to be beneficial. In humans, medical surgical treatment is lacking. We don't have the same data, although for spinal cord injury, we do. The North American Spinal Cord Injury Study, NASIS, suggested that megadose corticosteroid could improve outcomes in patients with spinal cord injury given quickly. And then the crush of an optic nerve done in animal models has been used to study optic neuropathy, but this is not how true traumatic optic neuropathy works. Real life traumatic optic neuropathy is a complex shearing injury, force directed injury to axons, vasculature and supporting structures. So when we try to study this in animal models, we have to come up with something better. And I'll show you that at the end, some promising methods that we have to learn more about how to treat patients with traumatic optic neuropathy. As I mentioned, steroids were first tried in, uh, over 30 years ago, and a number of non-randomized studies of traumatic optic neuropathy suggested it may be helpful. But in 2005, the use of corticosteroids in patients after head injury was demonstrated actually to be harmful. And we tried to avoid using them now in a patient who has a concomitant head injury as well as traumatic optic neuropathy. Additionally, people have rediscovered the fact that Ken Steinsaper 20 years ago in a animal crush model demonstrated that the same megadose steroid that is given for those spinal cord injuries when given to animals that have had their optic nerve crushed actually results in a worse outcome than if you give those animals saline. The saline treated animals did better than those treated with any dose of corticosteroids. So we need to be a little cautious in the use of corticosteroids. Indeed, one of the few prospective studies looking at uh, steroids for traumatic optic neuropathy where they randomized patients to placebo or a treatment group and actually followed all of them. None were lost to follow up. There's a trend, the dashed line, a trend towards improvement or better improvement with corticosteroids, but you can see there's a vast overlap between the two groups. And the conclusion was that steroid could not be defined as being better than placebo. So we, I'll mention one more medicine in a moment, but at this point in time, I don't use steroids for traumatic optic neuropathy. Do I do surgery? I've written a chapter here on the surgical management of patients with intrasheath optic nerve hemorrhage and the utility of doing optic nerve sheath fenestration. But you have to have an experienced neuroradiologist to interpret the fact that there is intrasheath hemorrhage and someone who knows what they're doing to drain this. In addition, and I think this applies to any kind of surgical intervention, it's critical that you can demonstrate to yourself that the abnormality is causing continued visual decline. And what I mean by that is if this patient came in with no light perception and a fractured optic canal, and you go in and decompress that canal, you do not know if it was the force of the injury that caused the vision to go to no light perception, or if it is the continued compression of the optic nerve that is causing that. On the other hand, if the patient is declining in front of your eyes, their vision is worsening, then doing a surgical intervention like this might make sense. There are many studies out there, case series really, that have been published primarily in the ENT literature, suggesting that endoscopic decompression of the optic canal is very effective. But I worry about those cases, those case theories, because there is no control arm. And indeed, that is what is lacking in all of these studies. Because if you look again at studies where they have a control arm, an observed arm, in addition to treatment arms, whether it's erythropoietin, whether it's steroid, when you include that control arm, you get results that are similar to the treated group. So I encourage any of you out there treating these patients, if you want to design a study, if you see, unfortunately, a lot of patients with traumatic optic neuropathy, do it in a way that will help us to learn more because this is a problem that can occur more than once to patients. Unfortunately, patients, at least in North America, who engage in risky behaviors that put them at risk for traumatic optic neuropathy once might do it again. 
And in a series of 12 patients seen over 18 years, the majority of whom had corticosteroids for their first injury, and all of the 12 improved vision after their first injury, they then had a second traumatic optic neuropathy, and regardless of what was done, none of them improved. So we need to do something that is going to protect our patients from these traumas and from repetitive trauma and vision loss. So I'll finish by talking about two promising animal models that might help us to learn more and come up with better treatments. This animal model was developed using ultrasound. So applying ultrasound to the brow of an animal, the ultrasonic waves deliver shock and injury to the optic nerve. And here you can see a normal retina or normal optic nerve, excuse me, normal axons. You lose axons even in the contralateral eye, unfortunately, and you have a tremendous loss of axons in the treated eye. And you can see that here, that the problem with this model is that it actually damages the contralateral eye as well. So you don't have a good control, one side being injured and one side not. But this is a promising model, and with refinement, it will help us to understand better what is happening. Here in a different model, the animal is actually impacted with a little hammer that hits with at either two or three meters per second velocity and delivers a controlled injury to the brow controlled force that is then transmitted to the optic nerve. And similar to the ultrasound model, you can see that controls, you have nice preservation of optic nerve function, but when you hit that animal with that plunger, with that hammer, the optic nerve is injured and the response of the retina and optic nerve diminishes as expected. So using these models may help us to use things like drugs, inhibitors of apoptosis, molecules like caspase 2 that may be involved in this whole process. And then finally, are there ways that we can bypass the entire optic nerve system, put cortical implants in to restore vision? This is also not a new idea. This is from the 1980s that a patient was implanted with a cortical device that then allowed him to drive around in a parking lot. So I am hopeful that in the future we will have better treatments that we learn from the laboratory and take to our patients to help them recover from these devastating injuries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Subramanian. That is just fantastic, and I learn. I keep learning new things as we go along. Can I ask you one practical question? Can you have traumatic optic neuropathy without an obvious RAPD? And are we missing cases and only picking it up much later when we expose them to a second injury? That's a very interesting point. We have learned that you can have subclinical optic neuropathy and that Perhaps by using other diagnostic means like OCT, we can pick up uh, macular ganglion cell complex loss or other evidence of optic neuropathy that may fall below the threshold. The RAPD is a wonderful clinical tool, but as you suggested, it's not 100% sensitive. And for those people who could have sustained a minor trauma and then a bigger trauma, it would be very nice to know what their status is after the first insult. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, I'll probably draw this session to a close, but just highlighting the fact that uh, ophthalmic trauma led lacrimal orbit, and finally, don't forget the optic nerve, and sometimes we end up thinking about the optic nerve in hindsight, because it's behind the eyeball, but actually put that in the forefront and try to look for early signs of optic nerve injury, along with other aspects of ophthalmic injury. Thank you very much for the great speakers. I hand you now over to Dr. Alia again uh, yeah. for the next session. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganga. Thank you for summing up the very interesting first session that we have here. So we're, we are now ready for the second session of this webinar, the anterior segment trauma. And for this session, I'd like to invite Dr. Johan Hudauruk from Indonesia and Dr. Mohan Rajan uh, from India. Uh, Dr. Johan Hudauruk is currently the President Director of the JCI Hospitals and Clinic. He is a renowned cornea and cataract refractive surgeon from Indonesia. And uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan is an anterior and posterior segment trauma surgeon from Rajan Eye Care Hospital, India. So uh, to both uh, Dr. Johan and Prof. Mohan Rajan, please, uh, the session is yours. Thank you Thank very much. You. So please, Mohan. Yeah, thank you very much, Johan. 
and uh, let me thank the airports and the jec for the joint organizing uh, organizing the joint webinar on ophthalmic trauma it's always a pleasure to be here and we have got a fantastic galaxy of speakers here on the anterior segment trauma we've got a huge experience uh, let me start off with the uh, can i have the first slide of the the panelists yes speakers the uh, the the first speaker is uh, uh, dr pusaribu and he is a cornea cataract and refractive surgeon from the jec hospital jakarta eye center hospitals indonesia and he's got a huge experience in anterior segment trauma as well next one please dr professor george jono and he's also from yeah george jono 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 he is also from the jakarta eye hospital in indonesia and he's also a cornea cataract refractive surgeon he's also got a huge experience in anterior segment trauma as well and uh, we go on to the next speaker and who is uh, lvso he is a video retinal surgeon from uh, uh, jakarta eye hospital uh, indonesia and he did his fellowship from the uh, from the usa as well he's got huge experience in the posterior segment trauma he's going to talk to us on severe blunt injury management from anterior to the posterior segment the part 2 as well next slide next slide please yes we have dr john jester and he is from uh, the, from the usa and he's got a huge experience in anterior segment and cataract uh, 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 surgeries as well and he's got also good experience with the uh, 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 with the, with the trauma and we are looking forward to his wonderful talk on uh, uh, jaster's fisherman's knot for the traumatic iris repair as well and finally uh, i am going to be talking on traumatic subluxated cataracts a very novel approach i'll be showing two cases on that thank you very much for this uh, uh, opportunity we we'll go on to the first speaker okay dr uchak please uh, share your screen with the surgical repair of corneal lacerations and anterior lens rupture thank you dr johan dr mohan thank you let's i prepare the screen yeah this one okay. already sure yes. okay okay uh good evening everyone uh in this lovely evening i would like to share my case about surgical repair of corneal laceration and anterior lens lens capsule rupture This is a case a patient presented to our hospitals with one day history of penetrating injury while doing construction work. Fortunately, the trauma is not high speed and the damage is limited to the anterior segment of the eye. There is central corneal laceration and the anterior lens capsule has been ruptured. The posterior lens capsule is intact and there is no posterior segment trauma no retained foreign bodies are found uh, the, there are three options for surgical repair for this case first close the, the corneal laceration and defer the cataract removal for later uh, second close the corneal laceration remove the cataract and leave the eye affected or the third close the corneal laceration remove the cataract and place the IOL and i choose the second one close the corneal laceration and remove the cataract and left leave the eye affected this is my video case first i identify the wound and we can see there is double layer in superior side of the cornea cornea and then i make incision and perform reform the anterior chamber and release the anterior synechia the decision is uh after that using 90 nylon suture the corneal laceration is closed until 
it is mostly watertight. And place this shooter at 90% depth without penetrating the cement membrane. And in this case, we have to uh, make sure the corneal rupture rupture is in in a good position. After I close all the rupture with the nylon suture. I make this video faster, yeah. I put the dye intraocular into anterior chamber and we see there is a little leakage in the scleral and then I make a one stitch there. After that, we I try to make a capsule rexis if possible convert a small rupture of the anterior lens capsule into a capsule rexis. But in this case, I use a cystotome to perform a can opener style capsular. Because a patient is young and the lens is soft, it can easily aspirated using the manual irrigation aspiration and remove the entire lens being careful not to grab the capsule or cause a posterior capsule extension and removing all the viscoelastic using the B manual instrument and the end the surgery I close the main port and fill the under chamber with air bubble. Sorry to interrupt the three chop the 30 minute um, yeah. at the 30 seconds time. Uh, 30 seconds. So, what we can learn from this case, first, surgical closure should be proceed in timely manner uh, to decrease the risk of endophthalmitis, avoid tissue necrosis, and decrease patient discomfort. And the second, the goal of corneal suturing is to make the wound watertight to, minim to minimal scaring and reconstruction of the native non-astigmatism corneal contour. And the last one, the anterior capsule lens, capsule lens rupture is best treated by immediately, immediate extra capsular, capsular extraction. The lens matter should be irrigated out of the eye with a two-way cannula, hopefully preserving the posterior capsule. Thank you. It's a very nice uh, pre presentation, uh, Professor uh, Yukok, uh, Professor Pasiribu. It is very nice. Uh, only thing I would have done differently would have been the, because I do the uh, corneal repair and the, the primary uh, surgery itself. I remove the cataract and put a lens because I'll be able to put a lens in the back. But I want uh, the opinion of Dr. Johan also on this um, uh, particular thing. My co-moderator, whether you would have put a lens or you would have left the patient a fake and uh, done the secondary eye will implantation later. Yes, based on the, the other eye, I usually, if there is no uh, difficulties, I will put the lens in the back also. But maybe Dr. Uchok would like to see whether there is astigmatism and then also we we'll consider that after the surgery. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Very nice presentation. We can take some questions maybe at the end of the session. We'll go on to the next speaker, Professor okay. Yono. You can start, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I would like to share my... Yeah,
Please share your screen, sir. Yeah. One moment. Yes. Okay. Can you see that? Fine. Yes. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I would like to present these cases. This is a 33 years old man who has been beaten by some people one day earlier. He came with his very blurred vision and only hand movement. And the eye with uh, in palpation is soft. There is a swollen of the eyelid. There is a subconjunctival hematome. Uh, corneal udem was a dim and, and even though there is a deep anterior timber with second uh, two plus flare, but there is a high femur of one millimeter and there is a vitreous in the anterior chamber, white dilated fixed pupil and superior iridodialysis and subluxated and traumatic cataract. Uh, the uh, fellow eye was uh, uneven tool and the diagnosis was blunt trauma with uh, iridodialysis, high femur and everything. And uh, in my opinion, there is a, if there is a blunt injury, we can have a uh, two direct uh, forces. Well, one is the direct forces, which might be making the angle recession. There is a high femur, and might be there is a retinal dialysis from the aura serrata. There is macular udem, might be, and choroidal rupture and scleral orbital floor. And the counter group forces might came to zonalysis, subluxated lenses, uh, might be there is lens capture rupture, iridodialysis, and pupillary sphincter rupture and vitreous prolapse. So the uh, green, uh, the yellow one, I do think that it will be happening in this patient. So this is the first, uh, the next day I will do the surgery is in just a uh, uh, local anesthesia. Uh, we put the, the we starting with some subconjunctival uh, silocaine and then I make a <coughs> incision of the superior side uh, and the anterior. This is to starting to do the uh, Iridodialysis repair for both sides. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we proved. So we repair first the iridodialysis, and we could see that uh, actually the the lens is also uh, can see some there is some rupture in the in the lens, and also uh, uh, we do the. Uh, then I I do things that we better to do just uh, intracapsular uh, intracapsular cataract surgery, but there is some rupture again in the hair. Try to uh, fix the vitreo, vitreous prolapse thing. And then we clean up the anterior chamber. Uh, but I, choose, I, I I decide that just to leave it first as a, a, a facet, because I do think that there is a, a vitreous uh, hypothesis and retinal detachment. So just clinic up everything, close, and then fill the anterior chamber with uh, uh, air, air bubble to, to separate all the uh, strand to the, to the cornea. Okay. Uh, so the next day, we could see that the eye still soft, hand movement, there's still some subconjunctival hematome, the coronary edema, and white dilated. This is, uh, and it is would be followed by the my colleagues, uh, Dr. Elfiosa, who is doing the vitreoretinal surgery. Say, Dr. Elfiosa, please. Thank you very much, Professor okay. Sir. And uh, yeah, I yeah, think we'll go on to the second part. Elfiosa yeah. will yeah. talk about the second part. Okay. Uh, in the case of blunt trauma, Retinal treatment is a complication that is quite common. This case is a blunt trauma due to hand uh, blow which begin with irredeemable disease repair and traumatic cataract. We can see that there is a retinal treatment that is quite extensive in almost all quadrant. The procedure was started with a corpitectomy and then a PVD induction was performed then proceed with a peripheral vitrectomy as clean as possible. After the vitreous is clean, subretinal fluid is slowly removed until the retina looks flatter. And after a flat retina, it appears that on the nasal side, there is retinal dialysis for three o'clock hour. Subretinal fluid residual were evaluated and removed. And after the retina is completely flat, 
an endolacer is performed on the dialysis area and the entire peripheral retina. After the laser, it was confirmed that there was no fluid in the subrenal area and a tamponade of silicon oil was given. And the sclerotomy wound is secured to ensure there are no leaks and operation done. After three months of the retinal detachment operation, at this time, an evacuation and pupiloplasty will be carried out as well as secondary implantation. After the silicon oil is removed from the vitreous cavity, the structure of the retina was evaluated. The retina is attached, but there is a membrane on the superior arcade and nasal side. Membrane peeling was performed to prevent further complication. And after the membrane has been successfully removed, the laser is performed on the wound area and the entire paper of the retina to prevent further traction. And after confirming that entire retina is attached and laser, the procedure is followed by pupiloplasty and secondary implant and uh, double net skipper. And continue by Dr. Yono. Yeah, tutup dulu. Tutup. Thank okay. you very much. I, I started with the... Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, this is the second surgery. Uh, we do the after the uh, Dr. Elviosa uh, pull out the the silicon oil. We start thinking to have a scleral incision, and then first I have to do the I make the second apart for the uh, secondary plan and starting to do the pupiloplasty uh, using the. Just directly like this. Okay. Yeah, uh, it is. It is important to have a, a, a fluid uh, from from the posterior that we, we did making the eyeball is still in pressure because otherwise, if it is become too soft, it is become more difficult to do. Uh, okay, we try the. Make the pupil plastic first, make it smaller. Okay, in the bottom one and then in the superior part. Because the there is a, a sphincter rupture and, and after the condition become the uh, iris actually become firm and there's no contraction. Okay. Uh, starting to implanting the uh, iris claw lens. She put, put it in the position and trying to still closing, more closing the pupillo in the superior part. Iris suturing. Okay. Okay, now I start to implanting the in the retro pupillary, I think from the nasal side. Uh, to me, it is more easier to have a, a, a retro pupillary because this is firm and then it is just pressing the lid, the, the iris. So now the iris is, uh, the pupil is already down there. We put again. Uh, start closing the bottom gap. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, closing all the things. Okay, uh, at the end we could see that that is actually then uh, the day one is still about about self I, but the visual in, uh, activity is already increasing, and we give you uh, level flexation and breath for the hourly and metal prednisolon, and uh, two weeks after that we could see that the vision is corrected is 0 0.4, the retinometric reading is only 0 0.5, the IOP back to 14 millimeter and are giving. Uh, endometas endometasin eye drops, and the take home message is that in severe eye injury may potentially lead to a blindness condition, which will be ruin the future life of the patient. So, prompt and integrated surgical intervention is mandatory to prevent further complication and blindness rehabilitation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. And Dr. Uchok for the very Wonderful presentations. I think for the interest of time, we should move on. Please, the move Next. on. Next speaker. Yes. Professor John Yastad is uh, from Ophthalmology University of Missouri, and we'll talk about fissures men's not for iris repair. Please, John. You're unmute. You're still unmute, John. Unmute. Okay. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so the um, original uh, Mechanal suture was developed in 1976, and then Dr. Siepser modified that in 2005. And uh, when I visited Indonesia, I developed a modification of that type of suture, which uh, we just heard about the importance of that and saw a good example of suturing the iris. And this is a, uh, can be used for either closing iris traumatic defects or to do pupillary cerclage to narrow uh, a traumatically dilated pupil. So basically two incisions are made uh, on either side, perhaps a clock hour farther from where you would like to close the defect. You place a, a tenoproline or Gore-Tex needle through the iris, out the other side, and then reach in with a Sinsky hook or Kuglin hook, grab a loop of the suture, and then twist it five times and then you just pull the needle back through. And we developed this because the seeps are not kept untying when we were trying that on another case. So this is based on the, what's called the fisherman's knot. And that's uh, used in sport fishing to hold hooks and it will hold a 20 kilogram fish easily. We make five loops in the suture. And then if this is the needle end, we pass this needle back through the loop and so it's easy to remember to do this. Uh, let's see, there we go. Let me get that to go. Okay, so we developed our technique and I'm just gonna show an example of that. This is Dr. John Jarstead, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Missouri, demonstrating the fisherman's knot for iris repair. This is an enlarged model to simulate suturing of the iris with the fisherman's knot. We pass our needle through the iris defect, reach in with a Sinsky hook or iris hook and withdraw a loop of suture. The loop is twisted five times and the needle is passed through the loop of the suture. <clears throat> this is then pulled securely and gently with each end, securing the fisherman's knot. But we always leave a locking throw behind, so we reach in and withdraw another loop of suture, twist this twice, and then pass the tenno proline needle through the loop one last time. Both ends are pulled gently to secure the fisherman's knot and it creates a very strong knot that will not untie. 
and it's easy to remember. We'll now demonstrate the fisherman's knot in an actual patient who had floppy iris syndrome and an iris defect. Here we are suturing the two sides of the iris and docking the needle with a 25 gauge needle. The suture is then withdrawn and a Sinsky hook is used to pull a loop of suture out of the eye. This loop is then twisted five times with some tying forceps and the needle is then passed through the loop of suture. Both ends of the suture are then carefully secured to complete the fisherman. And this is an example of a patient in Indonesia that we uh, found with a congenital coloboma and we were able to suture that with the fisherman's knot. That's actually the case that we discovered the fisherman's knot was useful in. So a few pearls in conclusion for iris suture repair. Uh, sometimes perfect can be the enemy of very good if you try too hard. Uh, and be prepared and ready to start before you take on a case like this. I would always recommend either a retrovulvar or preferably a general anesthetic because any sudden patient movement can be a disaster in these cases. So be quick, get in and get out, stop the anticoagulants for one week. And sometimes what they have is better with, than what they could end up with. So thank you very much for your kind invitation and an outstanding symposium. I'm honored to participate. Thank you, John. This is very simple and easy to remember. I would like to ask, why is it it should be five times, not three times? Have you tried the three times loop? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've seen some in untie with uh, less than five, and you can actually uh, avoid the second knot if you do five times. But oh. I like to put the second uh, back throw twice uh, just to really create a lock so it's never untied. Thank I you. do four times. Single pass four through. Four and two. I do I have four. Four four times I do. Okay. Yeah. Four months. Four months. I'll and show you for the second one. Two. Another two for the second throw. Yeah. Yes. Four. Okay. So also in answer to your question, uh, sometimes when you twist the loop, uh, you're not sure if you've got it, you know, three, four, or five times. But if you try uh, five times, then if it unwinds once or twice, you still have enough. That's okay. the main reason. Easier to remember than the sipsters. Yeah. yeah. I've seen the sipster untie with the second throw. Yeah. So that's what happened. That's why we discovered this, because uh, Dr. Nicholson said, it's an emergency. I can't tie a sipster knot. And he <laughs> says, I forgot how. And so I remembered from fishing my career as a fisherman you know, the fisherman's knot is the strongest knot we use for putting hooks on. Thank you. So please, Mohan. For the Thank you very much, sir. Shall I share my screen? Yes. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. yes sir. Thank you very much uh, for the um, APOTS as well as for the JEC. Let me thank uh, Dr. Elia, Dr. Yunia, and Dr. Gita uh, for the wonderful uh, coordination, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. These are my financial interests, which is nothing to do with my short CV. I'm going to show you two cases of uh, subluxated cataracts. The case one is a, a, man, uh, it's a very hard cataract, and my anatomy professor, one-eyed patient, because other eye is ambulopic, traumatic subluxated, the shuttlecock injuries, is uh, probably the worst in my opinion, as far as the cataract is concerned, as the anterior segment is concerned. You can see that I'm doing a rexis and can see that inferiorly there is a three to four clock hours of zonal dialysis there as well. This is a fairly hard cataract, grade four to a grade five as well. So immediately for the um, circumferential stability, I put the CTR and go ahead and I, um, uh, uh, with the, with the fake emulsification. I always use a, a, a venturi system like a Stellaris for this thing. And once I find that the, the, I was able to do the chopping, uh, I found that the lens was wobbling around. So for the anterior posterior stability, I brought in the iris hooks to, uh, for, the capsular, uh, for, for the capsular stability as well. So I went ahead with the FACO emulsification, making sure that the corneal endothelium is well protected by means of a very good vis uh, dispersive viscoelastic like viscoat. And uh, 
uh, making sure that uh, the reduce the parameters in the last piece and injecting viscoelastic when you come out of the eye because this is very very important because the bag is a little loose there and uh, uh, i always use coaxial irrigation aspiration and uh, when you have a ctr is always very difficult to uh, because it traps the cortex as well it's always very difficult to remove the cortex always you have to go circumferentially along the equator instead of going radially you can see this the upper left one the iris hook cut through the capsulorexis margin and and the tear went across into the posterior capsule and there was a vitreous loss as well so i did the anterior vitrectomy through the main port as well and uh, i put a multi piece lens um, as i told you the patient had traumatic mitriasis as well i put a multi piece lens into the uh, like an ma60 lens into the sulcus you can see there is a tear on the posterior capsule but the anterior uh, uh, the capsule uh, the, uh, the the rest of the capsule was intact the capsular excess margin was also there and i put the tricot and preservative free tricot to identify the vitreous you can go through the limbus but what i have done is i have gone through the pass plana because this is an a, a, a technique which has been advocated by uh, uh, abey vaswada i put a trocar and cannula measuring about 3.5 mm from the limbus and go behind so always it's re, uh, important that we remove the vitreous from behind not from the front because that re reduces attraction on the macula attraction on the vitreous base as well Uh, this animation so very well abey vaswada from ahmedabad has described this technique very nicely wherein you can go through the pass plana and remove the vitreous from the uh, from, from from behind without producing any traction and always making sure that the vitreous is also removed so this is the final picture you can see that um, i have removed the vitreous i'm doing the pass plana vitrectomy with an anterior chamber maintainer there removing <coughs> the the cortex as well and the lens is quite stable in the sulcus also and uh, the traumatic mitriasis i tried to uh, reduce the pupil size by doing a pupiloplasty unfortunately i was not uh, uh, very very successful because this is a trauma which is almost more than 30 years old he had an injury about 30 years back with a shuttlecock and he was very scared of doing the surgery because he was one night so always i close the all the ports with sutures whenever i have a vitreous loss and this is to just show you that the patient vision improved about 6 9 parts and with a 3 year post op the case two is i'm going to show you is a 20 year old girl with blunt injury with a stone 100 degree zonal damage traumatic mitriasis traumatic cataract small hydrodialysis intranasally macular scar pre operative vision was 2 by 60 i always use the femto cataract in these situations the catalyst because it makes life easy for us You can see here the capsular excess is already done. The segmentation is already done. You can see the inferiorly there the <coughs> there is a zonal weakness. It's not actually a zonal dialysis. It's a traumatic cataract. It's a non-progressive type of disease. You can see the uh, aortic dialysis also. Uh, being a young patient, the cataract was relatively very soft, and went ahead and did a capsular and the the cortical cleanup as well. Injecting isoelastic every time I come out of the eye and putting a CTR. and stabilizing the bag at that point and, uh, and then went ahead with uh, uh, putting a single piece hydrophobic acrylic lens into the bag and the lens was very stable so what do you do for the traumatic mitriasis the patient was having a lot of glare also and is young patient i don't want to do and also i want to do something for the hydrodialysis as well so i did a, what is called a single pass four through pupiloplasty which has been described by professor amar agarwal of india You can see here i'm doing a 10 nylon, nylon needle and doing a paracentesis and i'm doing a rail roading technique i'm taking <laughs> taking the two loops outside and passing it four times this is a single pass four through pupiloplasty which is sft i don't have to put a knot there just the four throws goes and sits on the iris very comfortably you can see that i'm multiple times i'm doing that making sure the pupil is there I'm making sure the Purkinje images are centered right in the center of the pupil as well, and uh, uh, trying to reduce the size of the pupil as well. So you can see that at the end of the surgery, the the pupil is uh, very nice, very nicely centered to a certain extent. It is not round, but it is to a certain extent small as well. The iris dialysis also became very, very small because of the pupil thickening. Because the iris was a little fragile there, I didn't want to. Uh, handled the iris and because of the intro nasal i left the patient again and because the patient had a macular scar the patient vision improved from of course 3 by 60 to 6 18 parts parts so these are the two cases i wanted to show you 
just to give an opinion about the two different ways, the many ways to skin the cat as far as the sublex and the cataract is concerned. The plan is to have a plan A, plan B, plan C for all these patients. And uh, thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity to the patient attention as well. Thank you, Mohan. Stop sharing. Nice presentations. Do we still have time, Dr. Alia? Yes. Uh, I think uh, you should move on to uh, the conclusion and the take home message for this session. Uh, as for the question uh, and answer, it can be done uh, through the column, the, the Q&A column uh, on the Zoom platform. Okay, please, the speakers, uh, directly answer from the Q&A. And for the take home message, uh, can you, uh, Mohan, for these sessions? I think uh, the take home messages are very, very clear. All the speakers did wonderfully well. The message is very important, especially when you have a corneal tear, when you want to have a, 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 a do the cataract simultaneously or leave the cataract for a secondary stage. It is for the for the surgeon, individual surgeon, whatever he is comfortable can do that as well. Number one. Number two, the second case showed that the staged approach is very, 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 very important. Taking care of the anterior segment and then taking care of the posterior segment and then taking care of the secondary IOL implantation. The only thing you, I would have done differently because the iris is already traumatized in that particular patient, I wouldn't have done an iris fixation lens. I would have done a glued IOL a skill fixation lens. But the, the results have been ultimately very, very good. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Um, uh, the, the Fisherman's Knot, which is, uh, which is also very good um, uh, uh, way of iris repair because the pupillar plasty is one of the major indications for the surgery nowadays because the patient takes, we take care of the um, uh, the contrast of the, uh, the contrast vision, the quality of vision as well, and the visual acuity also improves to a great extent. I think pupiloplasty, we should know how to do it, and there are different ways of doing it. And uh, Dr. John just said, has shown us a very nicely, a very nice way. And I have shown you uh, different ways of managing a sublex cataract as well. Overall, it's been a fantastic uh, um, uh, session, and I'm looking forward to a uh, a great webinar as well in the future in, in the next sessions as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, give it back to Dr. Alia then. Thank you so much, yes. Dr. Johan and Dr. Mohan. We have come to the end of the second session. And before we proceed to the third session, uh, the posterior segment trauma session, we'll take a quick uh, two minute breather uh, to see a special uh, message from our sponsor tonight. So, and for all the panelists, please uh, uh, turn on your camera and uh, here's a quick video for all of you to enjoy. Thank you so much for the comedy for showing us that. And we now uh, 
we will now proceed to the third session, uh, the posterior segment trauma, which will be moderated by Professor uh, Caroline Chi from National University Hospital Singapore, who needs no further introduction. She is one of the founding members of the Abbott Society. Uh, to Professor Caroline Chi, please, the session is yours. Thank you very much. I think uh, without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gita Lisa Adriano, who is a well-known vitreoretinal surgeon from our, uh, our host, the Jakarta Eye Center, and also in the Department of Ophthalmology of the University of Indonesia. She is going to show us a video on retinal detachment after blunt trauma. Dr. Gita Lisa. We, we also will be, uh, the second speaker of our session, will, uh, will, I'll have the privilege of introducing is Dr. Ryan Chang, who is the Chief of the Division of General Ophthalmology in the Taichung Veterans General Hospital, and is also the Director of the Department of Ophthalmology of the Tsinghua Hospital in Taiwan. And he will be uh, showing us endoscope-assisted vitrectomy and oculus injury. So let's, uh, we will now have our first speaker, Dr. Gita Lisa. Would you like to uh, show us your... Uh... Uh, yes. Thank you. Can you see my slide now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, thank you for, congratulations to APOS and also so Jakarta Eye Center, and um, uh, it's, it's an honor for me to be speaking among these uh, all excellent speakers. So I'm going to my case of cordial rupture, retinal detachment, and vitreous hammer. Report a female, 83 year old. She is a retired literature lecturer. She had left eye injury after falling on. She was traveling abroad to Korea. Uh, she had blurred vision of her left eye after four days of the accident. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you put it on the uh, uh, on the slideshow? Ah, thanks. Carry on. Okay. Is it okay? Now, and uh, she has a history of uh, primary open angle glaucoma and under anti-glaucoma eye drops, and also had cataract surgery of both eyes three years ago. So on presentation, her uh, right eye vision was six over six, but her left eye uh, vision, which had the accident, was hand movement. IOPs of both eyes were within normal limits. And um, I observed on uh, examination that day that she had eyelid hematoma, subconjunctival hemorrhage, a clear cornea, deep anterior chamber. Uh, fortunately, no hyphema was present, and the PCIOL was uh, in good uh, position. However, I cannot view the retina because of vitreous hemorrhage. So this is uh, the left eye posterior segment ultrasound that I took that day. So we can see here uh, in the vitreous cavity, there's um, um, diffuse of vitreous opacity, hyperreflectivity here. And in the inferior part of the retina, we see a shallow retinal detachment. So I diagnose this patient with left eye, left eye retinal detachment with vitreous hemorrhage due to uh, blunt ocular trauma. Uh, the, the surgery itself was done a little bit postponed. So it was done uh, three weeks after uh, she presented to me. So I did the left eye 23 gauge pars plana vitrectomy with endo laser and silicon oil. So uh, let me show the video. So after uh, putting a three port, uh, I address the vitreous hemorrhage first. You can see here, and uh, we could see that inferior nasal part, there is a, a subretinal hemorrhage, and this is a corridor rupture there. And uh, there's inferior retinal detachment. The retinal break itself was difficult to identify, so I made a retinotomy in the inferior temporal and did a fluid air exchange uh, until the retina is Then I saw, uh, sus suspected the area of, uh, and I continue with a uh, 
putting a 360 uh, 1300cc stoke silicone oil injection. And I put the patient in a prone position for two weeks. So on follow up, the left eye uh, best. Uh, reconnected again, sorry. Mm. Yes, can you, uh, can you see my slide now? Okay, um, so the, 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 the IOP was stable, the red tin merge was also mostly absorbed, and after five months we did the silicon oil removal on February 2019. And afterwards, uh, I saw uh, significant PCO, so an NDA laser capsulotomy was done two uh, months after, after the uh, silicon oil removal. Mm. And this is the condition one year post-operative. Uh, the, left eye, uh, the right eye was normal, and here we can see the, the left eye. The media is clear, the retina is attached, and the, uh, we, I, I'm sorry, this is a, not a wide field photo, but we could see the uh, laser scar, scars in the inferior uh, nasal part. And the left eye vision was six over 10. The patient was quite, quite satisfied. I think uh, I, I, I didn't see her afterwards. So um, uh, for the discussion, ocular blunt trauma usually is uh, caused by sports related causes, household, accidents, industrial accidents, or assault, and mostly in younger males. The retina uh, effects of blunt trauma may include commotion retina or Berlin's edema, cordial rupture, which is uh, quite uh, well-known, occurring in 5 to 10% of cases. Then we have vitreous hemorrhage, retinal tears, retinal detachment, with, which is a, a quite common complication accounting to 10 to 20 percent, shown by a uh, previous speaker, uh, Dr. Elviosa. And also, I think uh, this case is very because it's rather common happening in an elderly patient, aware of uh, the uh, high risk of falling in er elderly population. Uh, and they now they still want to remain active, go uh, traveling, and so, so we must be where and the corridor rupture is at the peripheral area not occurring at the posterior pole and the literature mentioned that red, red and ppp ppv with tamponade as a primary surgical technique was preferred um, as the uh, primary uh, uh, as the, the uh, primary approach and um, because of the complexity of the case, because uh, this patient had uh, RD and also vitreous hemorrhage and turns to the toroid rupture, and almost 40% of need retinotomies to uh, reach out, attach the retina. Rochi, I think we are losing Dr. Gita Lisa here. Uh, we can proceed to the next speaker if you like. Okay, so let, let's uh, let's uh, Dr. Ryan Chan, who will be talking to us. Uh, will be showing us an endoscope back to me in ocular injury. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Alia, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now, uh, Dr. Gita. Can, can, I, can I proceed? Just, uh, I think just the ending. I'm sorry for the bad connection. Can you see the slide? Okay. Yeah, we can see the slide. Okay, let's just finish up the... the uh, okay, okay. The, the yes, yes, I will, I will. So okay. I think uh, uh, the, the, in, in, in my case... Uh, uh, there, we, we did the surgery in a rather late uh, approach, uh, I mean, uh, onset, but it is, uh, there's an advantage of the, uh, 
if we do it early, there's a high risk of post-operative complications. In our surgery, the, uh, in our case, the surgery was done after 30 days and brought relatively good outcome. And I think uh, for the learning, learning uh, pearls, uh, blunt trauma can result in various manifestations in the procedure segment that may be vision threatening. Careful evaluation, early recognition, timely appropriate uh, follow-up are needed to ensure favorable outcome. And the correct diagnosis is cured by media opacity. And each case re uh, requires individualized approach. And the prognosis is related to severity of injury of its complications. I think uh, that is all. Uh, thank you. And I'm sorry for the uh, bad connection. And uh, someday we will meet again in a real life uh, seminar or Congress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kita Lisa. We, we can have some questions at the end if we have time. Mm. Right. So now I have the privilege again of introducing Dr. Ryan Cha. Uh, you can begin your screen sharing. Okay. Now, hi, everyone. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, now um, I'm honored to be here to share my case. Uh, I have only one case to share. Uh, this is a case with uh, traumatized uh, corneal blood scanning. I, I use endoscope as to assist the uh, retractome. Um, I have no uh, financial conflict to disclose. Uh, this is a, a 35 years old male um, suffered from uh, eye injury um, when he was working. And I was uh, referred because um, the uh, cornea of that patient showed cornea blood staining, but uh, the B scan in previous hospital um, suspect a posterior segment uh, injury. Um, the presenting lab, uh, visual acuity was bad perception, and uh, indeed there is a uh, there was the corneal blood staining and. Uh, in this case, I, I cannot draw a, a retinal detachment. So I, um, because of um, cornea blood staining, so I um, planned to use uh, endoscope to assist the vitrectomy. My endoscope system uh, is endo-optic V4. Um, be before I start the video, you, you must know, uh, have noticed that the, the image quality was not so good. It's not so good because um, that's the limitation of endoscope. So um, uh, when you see the video, you will notice that the, the high resolution of endoscope uh, are not so good even at this moment. We can see that there was a blood standing of cornea. And after we get um, enter into the uh, eyeball, the first test step is to remove the vitreous to a co-vitreotomy. The vitreous uh, in eyeball under uh, endoscope view. The background is quite dark, but the re re reflection of light of the probe, the retractor is uh, really strong. And then we can do the um, peripheral vitreotomy. Even we can do the uh, vitreotomy to the vitreous space to the oral cell type. And at the same time, we can also check the area to uh, even to a uh, retro iris area. Uh, after we um, remove completely the vitreous to the vitreous space, then I started to approach the epiretinal uh, blood clot. Um, it's impossible to, to have a bimanual uh, technique because you always have to use one hand to hold the endoscope. Uh, so we only have one hand to, to operate. Uh, be very carefully to remove the blood clot stick. Uh, it's really stick and attached to the retina surface. Um, the endoscope view is quite blurred because of the, uh, some blood float, um, floating. I trim the blood clot slowly carefully. Uh, you should keep your 
endoscope probe really close to the retina uh, because you cannot really know the distance between your receptor and the retina. That's not a 3D view, that's a 2D view. So if you keep your endoscope uh, too far to, your ret to the retina, then you will lose the, uh, you, you will not know the uh, real distance between your instrument and retina. And so you can be really careful to remove the blood clot quite slowly. Okay. And then uh, after you remove all the uh, apparatus block clot, we can also do gastro exchange if uh, the, the patient has retina detached or some retina breaks. Uh, so now I, I perform a gastro exchange. You can see the light reflex from the um, water surface. And there are some subretina hemorrhage and also there are some um, hematoma, but the retina can be reattached after all these procedures. The patient was so lucky that the, the subretinal hemorrhage just not involved the central macula. And the, the subretinal hemorrhage did not involve the fovea area. So I do a complete gastric change. <clears throat> Uh, apologies, Dr. Ryan, I think the time. Uh, okay. I almost finished my video. Sure. And be careful to the complication uh, that's on uh, iatrogenic retina break because you do not know the distance between your probe and the retina. So we sometimes we cause iatrogenic retina breaks. Okay. Um, my, videos, uh, my video was, uh, is finished. So that's my presentation today. Uh, I, I show everyone a uh, endoscope assistant assisted rechectomy. Uh, the key point I, I think is to be really careful to the distance. That means you should keep your endoscope probe to really close to what the area you want to operate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Uh, if I could just ask you, how, this is um, obviously a quite a steep learning curve. Did, did, how long? How many cases did you do before you were com became confident of doing this? Um, before I perform endoscope uh, retractomy, I I do some animal uh, eye um, training um, for months, and then. Um, but I think um, when if you ask me how for uh, uh, how long a training um, time I can get comfortable. I, I think maybe it take um, two or three years. Then you, <laughs> because at the beginning of the two or three years, I I always uh, cannot sleep, sleep well uh, before I have a, a case. Yeah. Okay. And have you tried using a temporary keratoprosthesis prosthesis for these patients who have got cloudy corneas? Um, well, not so much. Yeah. I, I did not do do the uh, temporary keratoprosthesis prosthesis myself, but I I have um a cornea man to help me do that. But um, sometimes I, I do not, uh, the, the reason why I keep using endoscope is uh, because it, it can check the really peripheral retina. And the other reason is the time um, and also the, the wound. Uh, because the wound of this uh, surgery is only uh, 19 gauge, but if you do a, a clutter process, it will be a 30, 60, 60 degree wound. So that's why. Thank you very much. Thank so, you so much. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Gita Lisa, for, for you know, your, your wonderful yeah. presentation as well. Sorry for the connection. No problem. So we can close this session now, and the next session will be on intraocular foreign bodies. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Caroline Chi, for the very interesting session. We will now proceed to the fourth session titled Intraocular Foreign Body, which will be moderated by Dr. Tengku Ayn Kamaldeng. Uh, she is a future retinal surgeon from University of Malaya, uh, Malaya Malaysia, and she's currently the associate professor at the University of Malaya Medical Center.
So, Dr. Tengku Ain, please, the session is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Alia. Uh, Assalamualaikum and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to moderate this wonderful session. I have the privilege of introducing two fellow vitro-retinal colleagues who are prominent surgeons in themselves to share their experiences and teaching us their pearls uh, in overcoming challenges in managing intraocular foreign body. So um, the first would be uh, Dr. Referano Agustiawan, a fellow vitro-retinal consultant and cataract consultant at the Jakarta Eye Center Eye Hospital, um, and who will be speaking to us about his experience in extreme fishing. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and the second speaker with, with, uh, is Dr. Hussein Kakan, um, who will be sharing with us his tricks and techniques of um, uh, getting fishing out the intraocularum body. He is a vitro retinal consultant, a very prominent surgeon uh, who's come out with many, many wonderful videos from uh, Pakistan, Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, I leave the, uh, the for Dr. Referano to present. Uh, if you could share your uh, Thank you, Dr. Tongkoain. Yes, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I want to share my case. It's actually four cases about the uh, uh, intraocular foreign bodies. Slide. Uh, actually, there is no, like uh, fishing, there is no clear cut technique to remove uh, intraocular foreign bodies. It depends on uh, velocity, it depends on the, how big the foreign body is. So I want to share my case uh, with several different uh, approach. This is the first case, male, 26 years old with uh, accidents with, uh, with metal during work with uh, visual acuity is only one meter finger counting with traumatic cataract. And actually I couldn't um, make sure the, the exact location of the foreign body from the B scan according to uh, low quality. So I decided to do vitectomy and FECO to uh, find the foreign bodies, right? And this is the video. So this is the port, and entry port is in the limbus, superior limbus. So I did the FECO and found there is a floating foreign bodies in under the vitreous and in the sulcus. You can see here. Just quite big uh, foreign bodies. So it's not seen in the B scan because it's very anterior. So I continue the, to, to do vitectomy and uh, I couldn't find any more foreign bodies in the vitreous, I put the transgenome to see the vitreous clearly to make a PVD and put the lens, okay, and put silicon oil inside, slide. And this is uh, six months after surgery, the visual acuity is 6-6, uh, slide. In other case, uh, there's a male 40 years old hit by a piece of metal. Visual, is, visual acuity is quite good, 0 0.3 with corneal laceration and traumatic cataract. So I plan to do a uh, corneal rupture repair with uh, FACO and vitectomy and removal of uh, foreign body slide. We can see here from the fundus photo, there is a retinal breaks just near the macula because of uh, foreign bodies and the foreign bodies in the temporal inferior of the macula, slide. This is the video. So uh, first I suture the uh, cornea to make airtight condition so I can do FACO and vitectomy more easily. You can see that there is a thick blood in the vitreous and quite big uh, foreign bodies, metal, and it look like the it hit the retina before it placed there. So I plan to remove the foreign body from the sclera with uh, X incision in the sclera. See? And uh, laser, uh, Barrett's laser in 
the retinal break slide and put the silicon oil inside. The visual acuity is 0.1 after surgery. It's less than before, but uh, it's quite good for traumatic, trauma, traumatic eyes, right? So this is the third case, a uh, male with hit, uh, history hit by a nail. Visual acuity was 0.2 with corneal scar uh, due to epitalized uh, corneal rupture with traumatic cataract, fetus hemorrhage, and intracranial foreign bodies from the B scan slide. So this is the surgery. We can see here the uh, corneal rupture already epitalized and just did the FACO. You can see here the hole in the iris due to high velocity of the foreign bodies. The foreign body is actually floating in the posterior vitreous. So I decided to remove it from the anterior chamber because it's uh, quite small. I grab with forceps and take it with my right hand uh, with uh, pincet. See. So I put a lens after word. Just uh, just keep in if, keep in mind if you want to remove the intraocular from foreign bodies from the andro chamber, just don't put IOL before the after the FACO. Just do it after the removal of foreign bodies. And I, I always do laser thirty six. 360 degrees to avoid retinal detachment afterward. Okay, this is after surgery slide. Uh, after surgery, uh, vision is zero, uh, 0 0.7. It's quite good. And the last case, uh, the patient sent me to me with a history of uh, hit by a piece of plate five days back. Uh, the visual acuity is 0 0.6 with epitalized corneal rupture, but there is no significant cataract, so, and the retina is attached, so I plan to do vitrectomy, extraction of foreign bodies, and silicon oil tamponade slide. Okay, this is the surgery. Uh, I can see the foreign bodies in the inferior of the retina. It's thick there, so first I do vitatomy and various la laser around the brick due to caused by the foreign bodies, and then remove the foreign bodies with forceps. This is uh, can happen to anyone when I grab the foreign bodies. The scleral tunnel is not enough, so I lose the grab. So the foreign body is fell down to the retina and cause bleeding. It's uh, some accident that you have to uh, avoid. And I clean the bleed and laser uh, all the bleeding source and laser and put the IOL inside. And even though the visual acuity is worse than before, is slight. Uh, but the patient have to back to his hometown in uh, another island, so I cannot see how uh, his condition right now. So uh, from this, uh, cases, we can conclude that there is no clear-cut technique to remove the silicon, uh, to remove the foreign bodies, and sometimes the prognosis is good, but sometimes uh, we have to prepare for the worst case. So it's uh, the prognosis of our IOFB removal can be highly variable, but it is often referable with the timeless surgical attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for Dr. Kartika for uh, editing my videos.
Thank you very much, Dr. Perefer. Yeah. That, that, that's that. Those are very good videos and learning points as well. Um, I sh I would like to invite uh, Dr. Hussein Khan next to share your screen. Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes. Yeah, sure. Can you? Uh, yes, we can see. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Hello. We we can yes. hear can you. Can you hear clear? me? Clear and loud. Yes. Okay. So okay. Thank you so much. So uh, my presentation is about the intraocular fun body. My previous colleague uh, has already described few tricks. So I will be very quick. My presentation includes uh, seven videos where you will see the different techniques of removing different types of foreign bodies. Uh, I have exact five minutes uh, video. So that's uh, I am starting it here. I have no financial interest for showing any uh, surgical video or any uh, technique. My case one uh, is a patient has cordial tear. It has been repaired at the primary care center here on the OCT UPS. We lost you there. Prof. Hussain? Oh, I'm sorry. I think we... Yeah, we, we lost you there. Would you like to share your screen again, Prof? I mean, why don't you move on to the next presentation and then he, when he's ready, he can come back. Okay, Same I time. think um, for... <laughs> Uh, Intraocular foreign bodies, we only have two presenters. Yeah. So. yeah, we only have two presenters. Yeah. Oh, I see. So, so why don't you lead a question answer session until he's ready? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Farron, I'll, I'll start off with the question. Uh, what's, what's, yes. how, what, what's your decision on the choice of tamponade that you, you, you choose? when you approach the foreign bodies? I uh, usually use silicone oil if uh, I saw the retina is not in good condition. Because in the traumatic cases, usually uh, there is so many RPE that can cause uh, uh, no. severe PVR. I think Dr. Hussein Akakan is already there. Yes, I'm here. Right? Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Can you share screen? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, just a second, please. Rafrano, you can continue answering. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, but if the the effect of the foreign body is not effect retina too much, so I just put the gas uh, instead of silicon oil. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So meanwhile, I'll, I'll just like to remind um, if the, uh, the presenters, if there are any questions and answers sessions, you can, uh, rep from the audience, you can reply them directly on the uh, Q&A column. So I, I'm sharing okay. my screen. Uh, can you share yes. my screen? Yes, we can, Prof. Yes, please. So, so, uh, so uh, I, I'm showing you the first case. Uh, here you can see the cotton scar and patient has a cataractic lens. Uh, so first the lens matter aspiration in this case was done. Uh, here you can see I am doing 23 gauge pass plana vitrectomy and removing the vitreous hemorrhage. So at this point you can see a large uh, intraocular foreign body that is at the inferior retina and anterior retina. You can see the size of the intraocular foreign body, and it was aphytic eye, and there was definite posterior capsule, so I removed it from coronal limbus. You can see the huge size of uh, this intraocular foreign body. These are the post-op images of this case. So now I'm sharing the second case. At a similar condition, almost the large intraocular foreign body, here it has a diffuse uh, vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, here you can see, but the difference here is the foreign body is very large and deeply embedded in the retina and chloride. First, I have to entangle it from the retina and chloride. Then with the end grasping forceps, I have to dislodge it from the retina and chloride. And you can see the size of intraocular foreign body. It's so huge. 
as it was a pseudo fake ai so i removed it from the parse planner side so that's another case i am coming from the large foreign body to the small foreign body this is relatively a small foreign body but it is deeply embedded inside the retina and choroid so i did and a laser and then you can see i have to remove it from deep in the choroid uh, it's relatively small for a body the trick here is that it has been hidden under the retina and its choroid so i am removing it from the parse planner and these are the post of images retina is flat and the vision improved so here i come with another case this is a fake eye but the difference here is that you can see the intraocular large foreign body it is lying under the retina and retina is totally detached so what i have to do to remove it from underside the retina so i displace the uh, 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 sub retinal foreign metallic foreign body from macula with a soft tip extrusion needle and did the retinectomy in the supranasal area so from the retinectomy i will remove this sub retinal intraocular foreign body in this detached retina you see with the soft tip extrusion needle i am moving this foreign body to the retinectomy area so with the cloth forceps intraocular foreign body forceps and with the help of light i am removing this large intraocular foreign body from sub retinal space so you can see the huge size of intraocular foreign body it has been displaced uh, in the sub retinal space and uh, it is a fake eye so i am removing it from the limbal wound next my fifth case this is a cataractus eye post traumatic corneal tear repair done at the other center again lens matter extraction removal here the trick is that while doing the vitreous uh, clearance you can see the foreign body was lying in the vitreous as it cleared the vitreous hemorrhage then it fell down on the macular area and it traumatized the macular area so it's it's always wise uh, to keep an eye on the uh, on the a foreign body while doing clearing the vitreous hemorrhage so this is also a intraocular foreign body case here you can see hemorrhage is resolving phase and it is not as much dense the trick here is that i am holding this foreign body with a cloth for forceps but as i try to remove it it slipped away from my forceps and fell down over the retina but in this cloth forceps i have a magnet so with the magnet i am just touching the foreign body and lifting it not holding it and putting it over the hemorrhage and then again i am grasping it with the magnet cloth forceps so this is just a trick if it falls down if you have magnet forceps then you can easily lift it up and remove it uh, so easily so this is just a very simple case just for a lesson this is foreign body is very small and it's lying in the mid vitreous cavity i prevented it to uh, to fell down on the retina but oops when i try to remove it it lost at the parse plana uh, 23 gauge port so the trick here is that you then have to indent it and i have found it at the uh, and found it at the uh, parse plana area so with the indentation i found it and it's not always lucky to find it in the anterior space so i just found it over there and displaced it with the light and engrafting forceps in the mid vitreous cavity and then at the end i was successful to remove it thank you so much for your kind attention if you have any questions i am here and my aim is there i was a little bit quick because i was given 5 minutes time hope i tried to convey my message through my seven videos thank you so much thank you very much prof um that was really enlightening um thank you both speakers i'll just like to summarize um um the points from both presentations i think uh, managing intraocular foreign body is an acid test for most surgeons and for vr surgeon when it hits the posterior segments and it can be from something is easily visible to something hidden and from something simple to something technically challenge and i think at all times we might agree that we anticipate and prepare for all the intraoperative possible intraoperative complications and always be ready to improvise our techniques so um with that i leave the floor back to dr alia thank you so much dr tenko ain so uh that was a very interesting session the intraocular foreign body session so we will now proceed to our last session of today's webinar So please, uh, for all participants, bear with us. This is the last, the very last session, with the topic of visual rehabilitation after trauma. 
This is a very interesting uh, session, and uh, it will be moderated by Mrs. Annette Hoskin from um, the Lions Eye Institute, Sydney, Australia. She has done quite a very good job in the uh, field of visual rehabilitation after of time trauma. To uh, Ms. Hoskin, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Dr. Alia, and let me say how very pleased I am to help moderate this very last session. I think we've saved the best till last. We have Tri Rahaya from um, our host, the Jakarta Eye Centre. Um, she's a cataract and refractive um, surgeon who also has um, lots of um, knowledge and understanding relating to uh, contact lenses, and she's going to be presenting on scleral contact lenses for post traumatic eyes. Um, and we also have Daniel Bohan from Singapore, National University Singapore. Um, he's a specialist in low vision and rehabilitation. And he's got a very interesting topic of lens on the loose, visual rehabilitation for a subluxated lens. I'm going to hand straight over to Tree to speak on uh, cataract and refractive surgery, no, scler scleral contact lenses. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ms. Annette. Uh, because I'm uh, from uh, Bali, it is a remote area. So I already have pre-recorded video for my presentation. So please, the IT team, uh, play my uh, presentation video. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Today, I will present my topic with the title, Scleral Contact Lens post for Post-Traumatic Eye. Traumatic ocular injury can significantly reduce patient ability to function. The symptoms may be vary from mildly irritating to visual debilitating. Visual outcome following repair of post-traumatic penetrating corneal injury may not be optimal due to presence of irregular keratometric astigmatism. Eye injury caused by chemical or burns can lead to significant damage to the corneal surface resulting in scarring, astigmatism, discomfort or pain, and visual distortion. Scleral contact lens have play role in a traumatic eye. In post-repair corneal penetrating injury, scleral contact lens can mask significant amount of irregular astigmatism and can improve the vision. In post-chemical eye injury, scleral contact lens help provide clearer vision while also hydrating the eye, protecting it from further harm or irritation and allowing it to heal as best as possible. The design of scleral contact lens contain of optical zone, transition zone, and the landing zone. Uh, fitting step in contract lens, uh, scleral contact lens, uh, we must evaluate the diameter, clearance, landing zone fit, lens add, and non-rotationally symmetrical design. Uh, for the diameter, total diameter of the contact lens um, have most basic consideration. Large contact lens give more fluid reservoir. It is a benefit for fragile corneal epithelium and tend to decenter temporarily. Small contact lens are more stable and it form more than normally shape the cornea. Optical clearance diameter give good optical outcome. Usually it is 0.2 mm larger than corneal diameter. Um, for evaluating the clearance, the corneal clearance uh, should be 200 to 300 micron, considered sufficient. And also we must evaluate the limbal clearance. Uh, landing zone, uh, closely related to the clearance, the goal of this landing zone is create alignment with the scleral or corneal scleral transition. Evaluation can be performed by slit lamp evaluation with fluorescent evaluation and also with the anterior segment OCT technique. Uh, the lens edge um, make the good edge lift promote healthy lens wear, but too much edge lift causes lens awareness and discomfort and low edge lift can leave a full or partial improvement of ring on the cornea. Uh, movement must be evaluated. Typically, uh, scleral contact lens do not move. Push-up test should be reasonably mobile and vertical movement 
uh, it doesn't increase their circulation, so we must uh, evaluate it. After we choose the best uh, diameter and base curve of the contact lens, then we perform over refraction. Lens power should not be main consideration during lens fit, but creating optimal lens fit is the first most important objective. Uh, insertion and removal of the scleral contact lens also challenging to the patient and also us as a provider. But because it is uh, different with the conventional RTP. Uh, this is our two case. The first case is a 48 years old female with corneal scar and aphakia of the left eye after penetrating injury. So after the surgery, the vision of the left eye become one meter finger counting with plus 14 uh, diopter of uh, spherical lens. Uh, it could be reached. 0.4 only. With the scleral contact lens, we use Jupiter here, the visual acuity could be reached 1.0 or 2020 vision. And this is the second case. It is 48 years old male with the severe chemical injury of both eyes. The left eye only have hand movement vision, uh, even though it is already performed keratoprosthesis. The right eye have a scarred cornea and neovascularization cornea. Um, the vision can be reached 0.15 with the severe dry eyes. Jupiter contact lens, uh, scleral contact lens can give 0.4 vision. It is increased from the uh, spectacle correction and also give the improvement in dry eye symptoms. This is the anterior segment OCT uh, for the second case. Uh, the scleral contact lens get, give central clearance of about 30, 300 uh, micron. It is considered enough. And also have uh, about 100 um, mm micron of the temporal and nasal uh, left edge. So as the conclusion, scleral contact lens can improve the vision and comfort in post-traumatic eyes. However, its fitting still be challenging uh, as us as a contact lens provider. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rahayu, um, for a very enlightening presentation and I think this really highlights um, a different, the sort of difference you can make with visual rehabilitation, um, particularly for those patients with very little vision remaining and any, any amount that they can gain um, is helpful. So I'll, with that, I'll hand over to Daniel. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Annette. And good evening, everyone. Um, so today I'll be sharing a case uh, on how we approach uh, and provide vision rehabilitation for subluxated lens, which is uh, which can be a, a common uh, impact of uh, of of ophthalmic trauma. And uh, somehow these patients um, we are not able to um, cure their sight, and we we try our best to explore means and ways to make do uh, in maximizing their remaining vision, and at the same time uh, preserve their functioning and improve their quality of life. So this uh, patient is a 50-year-old female that presented to us uh, with sudden vision loss. Uh, she has high myopia and a history of blunt trauma to both eyes five years ago. And her presenting VA were 636 in both eyes uh, and improving to 618 with pinhole. And cover test showed uh, intermittent XT. And on examination, uh, we found a bilateral uh, inferior lens subluxation and she also had myopic uh, maculopathy. Um, because of the complexity of this case, uh, surgical uh, intervention uh, was not uh, indicated. Um, then she was referred um, 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 for further um, assessment and refraction. Um, so we proceeded with retinoscopy uh, for both the phakic and aphakic portion. So this is something that is unique um, um, uh, presentation that we see in subluxated. Uh, lens where we see um, both the phakic and the aphakic portion. 
And um, this is where we, we need to carefully observe uh, the two portions. And when we do retinoscopy, um, you know, it can be a bit tricky, but you know, it helps to um, recognize and identify the fake portion and the uh, fake portion and then perform the rats from there. So sometimes I would do a what we call um, um, a, uh, a peripheral retinoscopy where I try to identify the reflex at the, the edge um, of the lens. So the, the fake uh, retinoscopy revealed a minus 13, whereas the fake um, retinoscopy uh, reveal a plus 18. We proceeded with a manifest refraction um, and the patient subjectively accepted a minus 12 on the right. Uh, that improved to 624 and accepted a minus 10.5 on the left and uh, that improved to 624 and with a plus 2 add uh, is able to resolve uh, N8. Uh, and because uh, there is no further improvement from here, she was referred uh, further for vision rehab. So on the first visit um, uh, at the low vision clinic, uh, she complained of difficulty seeing signs um, ahead you know, when she takes the bus or when she's trying to look at road signs and also difficulty in reading newspaper. Um, presenting BA with the glasses is 630, 645 and near is N18. So we see a bit of troubling there um, trying to read up close. Uh, we did a manifest refraction um, and it revealed a minus 11 with minus 2 sail. Um, X is 90, that brought her to 624 on the right, whereas on the left is minus 11 with minus 1.5 seal with X is 90, which brought her to 636. And we gave a plus 4, which is a default um, magnification um, factor. So plus 4 equates to plus 1, um, 1 times magnification. And from there, she's able to resolve N5, um, which is smaller than newsprint. Um, but subjectively, no further improvement in visual equity. And how I like to uh, qualitatively assess for visual improvement is I like to stand in front of the patient, uh, maybe three to four meters uh, in front, and use my face as a gauge because that gives me um, a sense of contrast improvement. Because sometimes it doesn't show up, you know, the VE doesn't show up, but you know, we could, the patient can appreciate an improvement in contrast. So I will stand in front of the patient three to four meters ahead and then put on the new uh, RX and see whether there is a difference in my face. Um, and sometimes I, would, I, I like to use a clock um, that is hanging on the wall and to see if the patient can tell the time. So that's a good gauge that, you know, there is a functional gain um, with the new prescription. And from there, uh, I also explored a hand magnifier, uh, you know, that would improve uh, a newspaper reading and that allow her to read uh, up to N5, okay, with a four times or equivalent to plus 16 diopter. And to address her, her, her impairment at distance, uh, we explored a telescope, uh, a simple handheld telescope, and that um, basically gained um, her vision to 6.9 with a three times three power telescope equivalent to plus 12. So the plan was to continue to um, uh, wearing her, her glasses, um, but I also advise her on protective eyewear, preferably if she could uh, put on um, a, 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 a pair of sunglasses over, a, a fit over, or you know, if she could consider getting polycarbonate lenses. Uh, and I prescribe a hand made fire for sustained newspaper reading uh, and also telescope when she goes out and about to see road signs and, and, uh, and, and street signs. And at two year follow up, she came back again to the low vision service and complaining of declining vision with existing glasses. And this time her VA has dropped further to 660 uh, on right and 645 on left, improving with pinhole to 618, which is a good sign. Uh, on examination, um, unfortunately, the, uh, there was further uh, inferior sub subluxation of the lens and now we could, we could see the visible lens edge. And when I did the retinoscopy, um, now I could observe the, uh, the aphakic portion, but somehow I couldn't um, um, appreciate the aphakic portion. So somehow the, the lens have actually subluxed further. Uh, and then from there, we obtain a plus 8 uh, with minus 2 seal that brought her to 618 on the right. Uh, on the left is plus 8 with minus 1.5 seal that brought her to 618. Uh, this was much better than two years ago. Um, with a plus 4 add, uh, it brought her to 6 uh, and 8. Uh, and with her current low vision aids, uh, it is optimal. She's reading N5, fluent uh, with newsprint. And with uh, her telescope, now she could see 6.6. Six. 
Uh, then I brought her outdoors because I wanted to uh, observe uh, the uh, effect of uh, meiosis. And this is important because in patients uh, with subluxated lens, uh, depending on um, where the phacic portion and the or the aphacic portion uh, will be positioned with uh, meiosis, it will have great uh, and significant impact on vision. So when we went outdoors, there was no um, um, significant uh, effect on her vision. So from there, we decided to update her glasses. Now, uh, you know, we prescribed her with uh, aphakic um, glasses, okay, and she could see 618. Uh, and to continue her low vision aid, and at the same time, uh, lifestyle advice uh, to avoid high impact or contact spots because it is important that we preserve her eyes and also her remaining vision. So the clinical pearls uh, for this is to highlight the role of uh, low vision and vision rehab uh, in the care of patients with uh, ophthalmic trauma. So these are the two main questions is to ask is uh, how is the patient impacted by the vision loss? Because vision loss uh, is highly subjective and no two patients experience vision loss similarly. So it's important to ask how are they uh, doing? How are they coping in their day-to-day -day activities? Are they still reading and how are they reading? Um, and also to ascertain the patient's uh, visual goals. Is it more important for them to see near, to see intermediate, like computer work, or to see far ahead? And in subluxated lens, it is important to dilate, uh, sorry, to refract the patient undilated and try to appreciate and try to identify and observe both the phacic and aphakic portion uh, and do retinoscopy. Uh, and then subsequently to proceed with subjective refraction both indoor and outdoor and see what works best for the patient. So sometimes fake portion, fake refraction um, works best at the same, um, at other times, sometimes it's the uh, um, fake portion that the patient uh, accepts. So it's, it's, it's good to explore uh, both findings and to go outdoors and see what's the effect. Um, at the end of the day is to optimize residual vision uh, as much as possible with uh, accurate refraction uh, and advice on protective eyewear. Uh, and also, uh, if possible, to avoid engaging in high impact or contact spots. So these are uh, uh, some of the learning points uh, that I've learned in managing this case. So that's my case. Thank you very much. And over to you, Annette. Thank you so much, Daniel. And you've, you've really um, hit some high points for me to close this session. And um, I'll hand it over to Alia in a second, but I just wanted to um, based on both of those um, great talks, I just wanted to give you three takeaways. The first one being that um, these patients are going to be really motivated. Um, so it's important to try and capture any vision or any um, additional comfort that we can for them at all. Um, and secondly, um, it's, not just, um, it's not just refractive gains that they can get. It can also be about... Um, dealing with some of the symptoms that they may have in terms of dry eye or glare. Um, and the last and very important one is about um, protective eyewear and ensuring that they're continuing to maintain as much vision as they can and protect whatever remaining vision that they have. So I'd like to again thank Daniel and Tree for their excellent presentations. And I'll hand over to Alia at this point. Thank you, Annette, for the very wonderful conclusion of the last session of visual rehabilitation after trauma. A very important aspect that we sometimes forget uh, on our patients. So we have now reached the end of this fourth APOTS uh, webinar in conjunction with the JECI hospitals and clinics. Very interesting cases that we had from all of the panelists and what a response from all of the participants. We can see the highly enthusiasm, uh, the high enthusiasm uh, coming from all the participants, the panelists, and also the moderators. Thank you all for sticking with us until the very end. Unfortunately, due to the time constraint, we are unable to answer all the listed questions uh, live, but most have been answered on the PNA column, I see. And a quick announcement, I think the IT team can show us the um, poster. Yeah, so uh, on the next September 5th and 6th, uh, I think it's two weeks from now, uh, there will be uh, a another virtual conference from this very society, the Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society, presents the fifth APOTS uh, virtual conference. So if you can all join us again in those uh, conference, it will be, it'll be uh, really uh, 
it will be our pleasure for you to join us all. And on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank all of the panelists, the moderators, and not to forget all the participants from all over the region that has made all this possible. Special thanks to the Asia Pacific Ophthalmic Trauma Society and not to forget our generous sponsor, Chenda Pharmaceutical, for making this happen. And we hope to see you all soon in the next meeting. Thank you all and good night.